start sharing your screen so we are ready when um, everybody is on. You're on mute, Kiara. Ian, can I ask you to maybe start sharing your screen so that we are ready when yeah. everybody's arrived? Okay. Great, thank you. I can't see it's on YouTube yet. Let's make it full screen on YouTube, Kiara. Uh, it's full screen on my iPad. Yes, yeah, so um, it should be okay now. Okay, so maybe we can get started now. Hi everyone, and thanks for joining us again at West. Uh, I'm Chiara Gattinoni, one of the organizers today, together with James Ewan here. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank everyone for the amazing participation last week. Uh, the video, which is now on YouTube on our channel, has had more than 700 views, which we think is pretty amazing. Um, for anybody who had asked questions during uh, the recording of the talks, the questions have all now been answered by uh, Rob and Stefan. So you can go and check and if you want to comment further, please uh, feel free to do so uh, throughout the duration of the, of the seminars. Um, so before we start, let me uh, uh, thank our sponsors, the Royal Society of Chemistry, Swiss Tribology, the Institute of Physics and the Institution uh, of uh, Mechanical Engineers. And um, with that, I think that's all the housekeeping for now. Let me introduce our first speaker, who is uh, Dr. Ian Taylor from Shell. He uh, has a long experience of working in a lubricant formulation, so he's going to tell us all that's going to happen in the lubricant world in the future. So over to you, Ian. Okay, thank you, Chiara. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about what I see as future challenges in lubrication and tribology. And for those who don't know me, my name is Ian Taylor. I'm a technology manager and I'm in the uh, movements innovation team within Shell. So I have to show a disclaimer slide, which hopefully will come up. Um, it's just lagging a bit, sorry about this. Can you see it yet? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry, I have to put this up for, for my company. Um, ju just in case anyone out there is thinking of investing in Shell, please don't take into account anything I'm about to say when you're making your decision. So um, that's what, I, what that slide is fair for. So my next slide is just going to talk about, um, it's just going to say what I'm planning Okay, so this is a personal view about what I see as some future challenges for lubrication and tribology. And the first one is I see that there's a need for better, much improved mixed and boundary friction models. So although there are very good models 
for predicting the effect of viscosity on film thickness and friction. The models we have available for boundary friction um, are much um, at a much more uh, lower stage at the moment. The second challenge I see is that there's a, a need to uh, combine film thickness and friction models with wear models. So um, a lot of people model the film thickness in a bearing or a piston ring or a valve train. And then when the film thickness is thin, um, you obviously can get wear and the shape of the surface changes. And when the shape changes, that will then uh, rechange the film thickness. So you really need to do the calculation again. So you need an iterative calculation in which you calculate the film thickness, you calculate what that means for wear, and with the new surface, you have to then recalculate the film thickness. And hopefully, um, you would find that the wear decreases over time, and you could then start to address issues like running in, which is a particular interest for things like the uh, piston rings. Then the third challenge um, I see, which is related to lubricant properties, is that there's a need for improved in-use lubricant data. So although the lubricant companies supply the standard viscometric properties of the lubricant, we find that those aren't um, sufficient to actually tell you the difference between different lubricants. And we often have to do a much um, broader range of lubricant measurements to find out what's going on um, in terms of the friction performance of lubricants in engines, um, or what the actual viscosity of the lubricant is in, say, an elastohydrodynamic contact. And all of these three challenges really feed into the ultimate aim, which is, can we in the future develop a digital twin for tribology? So instead of having to do tribology experiments in the lab, can we actually set everything up and run it on a computer and it's accurate enough to answer our questions? So I'll move on to the next slide. which talks about uh, improved mixed and boundary friction models. Sorry about this, there's a bit of a lag on the, uh, on the, on the YouTube. Ian, uh, so, yes, you, I'm can just, talk you can just talk and then the slides uh, and you're talking will all lag on the YouTube, but if you just talk what for what you see on the on your ipad that's what you should reference to okay so the first um thing i'm going to talk about is the most widely used model that i'm aware of for mixed and boundary friction and it's the greenwood trip model and this assumes that there are elastic asperities on the surface which are distributed in a gaussian distribution and the idea is as the two surfaces come together if the film thickness is less than the asperity height then the asperities will be squashed um, and Greenwood trip assumes that they're being squashed elastically and the change in shape of the asperity and the friction force is calculated from Hertz theory. Um, the ultimate uh, result of the Greenwood trip model is that you find that the friction coefficient should be given by a friction coefficient value when the film thickness is zero, which is F naught and a function which just decreases with the lambda ratio um, of the contact and the lambda ratio is the film thickness divided by the roughness. So the key thing here is that um, this equation says that if you have a contact with the same roughness and the same operating conditions, the, um, the friction film, the, the friction force should always decrease in the same way for all fluids. And the only way you can differentiate them is the value of F naught would be different. So that's what the Greenwood trip model says. But in fact, if we do experiments, we find that this is not really the case. Um, so one of the most popular ways of measuring friction over a wide range of lambda ratios is to use something called the mini traction machine. And this is a ball uh, placed against a disc. And the ball can be pure sliding or it can be rolling or anything in between. And the disc can rotate at quite high speeds. Um, up to about three and a half meters per second, but also down to speeds of a few millimeters per second. And so we get a friction curve generated for different lubricants over a wide speed range. And it's very easy to translate that data into friction versus lambda ratio. Um, so on this uh, slide that you'll see in here, uh, we've got 
uh, four different oils. The oil with the highest friction is a, a 10W40 engine oil with no friction modifier, but it's got um, ZETP anti-wear additive in. And the presence of the anti-wear additive means the friction coefficient stays high at about 0.12, up to a speed of about 100 millimeters per second before it then drops down. The second black curve with the triangles on is a base oil only. And that um, friction decreases with um, speed in a similar sort of way to how the Greenwood trip model would um, expect it to, which is the graph on the left-hand side. The red curve is a base oil, um, a zero W20 uh, engine oil, sorry, um, with an organic friction modifier in. And so the Greenwood trip type model uh, curve of the black triangles, uh, we're seeing a reduction in friction at the low speed end. And then the final oil is a zero W20 oil with molybdenum dithiocarbonate um, friction modifier in. And here we're seeing a very low friction level of about 0.04. And um, we're, um, we're seeing it very flat up to speeds of about 100 millimeters per second. So what we're seeing here is that the Greenwood trip model um, looks okay for base oils, um, but it doesn't seem to work for oils which have surface active additives in. So what could we do about this? Sorry, I'll just change my slides around a bit. Um, how could we go beyond the Greenwood trip model to get a better, a better um, way of mixed and boundary friction? So one way forward is we could directly measure friction coefficients um, versus the lambda ratio in the laboratory. So we could use a mini traction machine or a reciprocating tribometer. Um, and then we could use those measured curves directly in the mixed and boundary friction models rather than the Greenwood trip model. So the advantage of this is it would be quite simple to do, but the disadvantage is that there's not really any insight into why the friction curves are as, as they are. The second route, which is slightly more ambitious, is can we go back to the Greenwood trip model and adapt it so we could actually put a tribo film on top of the surface um, and put in the uh, things like the elastic modulus of the tribo film and see if that just changes the way the asperities distort. Um, and then that might be able to explain why we're getting these different shapes in the friction curve. So this could give useful insights, but it's a more complex approach. But um, certainly uh, we do need improved models to say what the friction is during the mixed and boundary regime. So the second challenge I want to go on is to talk about how we can have um, a combined model looking at film thickness, friction and wear, which we iterate around to see how wear evolves over time. And for this work, I'm going to focus on a reciprocating contact such as um, the contact you get in a piston ring or a valve train or in a, in a tribometer, such as a plint or an SRV machine. So in a reciprocating contact, uh, the thinnest oil films occur at the end of the stroke. And um, if, we, if we look at the Reynolds equation and apply it to a reciprocating contact, um, we should find that the film thickness is largest in the center of the stroke. So this is the left-hand graph um, on, this, on this slide. And if we apply the Reynolds equation to this situation and we ignore the squeeze film, we get the black dotted line. And so the Reynolds equation without the squeeze effect will predict a film thickness of zero at the ends of the stroke. Um, but a reciprocating contact and a piston ring is one of these situations where we can't ignore the squeeze effect. Um, and so if we do the calculation again, but include the squeeze effect, we get the red curve. And this is quite interesting for two reasons. The first of which is there's no longer a zero film thickness at the end of the stroke. We're now in this particular simulation finding a film thickness of about half a micron. 
And the second interesting thing is that the film fitness is different going one way in this in this tribometer than it is in the other way. So the effect of including the squeeze term results in an asymmetric friction curve. And this is what you actually find if you do an experiment with, um, with a plint or an SRV uh, machine. The friction curve is asymmetric. And the more asymmetric it is, the more that the squeeze effect would be there. So the, the key point about this is that in a reciprocating contact, we need to include the squeeze effect when we simulate what's going on. And we also get the thinnest films at the end of the stroke or close to the end of the stroke. But we need to include the squeeze film to get the right film thickness so that we can then um, predict what the wear will be. So this next slide shows schematically what happens over time in a reciprocating contact. And in, any, in these simulations, I'm assuming that the pin is harder than the substrate. So we, at the start of the test, um, we have our pin in the middle of the in the middle of this um, slider, and it goes backwards and forwards, and we get the thinnest films at the end of the stroke. So we're midway through the test. The surf, flat surface at the bottom has now been modified so that there's worn portions at the end of the stroke. And at the end of the test, we'll, we'll likely have even more wear there. But the key thing is um, that this change in shape of the flat region means that the, um, the contact is effectively much flatter now at the ends of the stroke. If you imagine that pin going over the um, worn part at the end, that looks now looks like a much flatter contact than the contact in the middle. And what happens in the, with the squeeze effect in the Reynolds equation is the flatter the contact, you get a thicker flip squeeze film. So over time, you'll start off right at the start of the test with very thin films at the end of the stroke. Midway through the test, you'll get wear occurring, um, but you'll get now get the film thickness at the end of the stroke being thicker and at the end of the test, hopefully the wear will have um, settled down and you can run this without basically any more wear occurring. And the reason this is important to get right is that um, there are components in an engine, the main one being the piston ring, where we are very interested in the friction and wear of the piston ring during the engine cycle. Um, the piston assembly accounts for approximately 50% um, of total engine friction. So it's very important to understand what the actual friction is of the piston assembly with different lubricants. And there's many published studies of piston assembly friction, which predict very high levels of mixed and boundary friction. And they, it's difficult to see how those high levels are consistent with piston lifetimes, which last for at least 100,000 miles for cars and more than a million miles for heavy-duty trucks. And I think what's happening, and if we look at this schematic drawing on the left-hand side, is that a lot of people model the piston ring liner contact with a brand new piston ring and a brand new liner. And if we um, think back to the previous slide where I was explaining what happens um, as the hard pin moves against the flat surface, if we imagine here that the piston ring is harder than the liner, um, the process of wear will occur, you'll find that the liner right at the top dead center will be worn so that the um, piston ring liner contact is now much flatter. But at the same time, the wear will also reduce the surface roughness. So the little table at the bottom, if you've got brand new components, the film thickness at top dead center might only be half a micron. Uh, uh, the tip, yeah, the film thickness at the top dead center might only be half a micron but the roughness might also be half a micron. So there you would have a lambda ratio of one, which would say that under those conditions, you're in boundary lubrication regime and, and you get wear. Um, but after it's run in, you've got a higher film thickness at top dead center because of a better squeeze effect. And so if you assume the film thickness is now one micron at top dead center, and we've also reduced the roughness because of the wearing process to 0.25 microns, you can see that the process of running in would lead you to a, a lambda ratio of four, where it's almost in hydrodynamic regime. So the important thing here is that if you actually model 
um, film thickness, what that means in terms of wear, and then redo the calculation, you can potentially predict running in processes. And in running in, we, we've got a, um, a standard schematic chart at the bottom right of this slide, which shows you get the most wear right at the start of the test. And as the test progresses, the wear slows down. And eventually, once the contact has run in, um, the wear is then very low. So the route forward here, potentially, is to have a more iterative process where we predict the film thickness for component using the ASNU profiles and the relevant operating conditions. From the film thickness, we then predict the wear of the shape of, of the contact and the new shape. And then we go back and recalculate the film thickness for this new shape. And we should hopefully find that the wear is progressively getting lower and lower. And eventually we would find what the running um, shapes are, but also what the friction is after the running in has produced, uh, has finished. Of course, I mean, it may be that under certain conditions, this process wouldn't lead to running in, it would actually lead to failure. So this iterative process would actually be able to tell you under the relevant conditions and the, and the relevant contact, whether machine elements are likely to run in or whether they're likely to fail. So the third challenge I would like to talk about is about how we better understand what the lubricant properties are actually in a, uh, a lubricated contact during operation. So if we look at a lubricant data sheet, the uh, supplier only usually lists the kinematic viscosity of the lubricant at 40 degrees and 100 degrees centigrade. And for engine oils, they may also include some high temperature, high shear viscosity values. So often the high temperature, high shear viscosity at a shear rate of 10 to the 6 and 150 degrees centigrade is often quoted. And also for engine oils, the high shear viscosity at low temperatures, uh, minus 25 or lower, depending on the viscosity grade, are also quoted. And we often also have um, the density of the lubricant at 15 degrees centigrade that's um, quoted. But unfortunately, it's not easy to get access to the high shear viscosity data at other temperatures. And also the supp lubricant suppliers don't often um, uh, report what the high pressure viscosity data is. And these properties are really needed to understand fully the properties of lubricants in real contacts. So as an example, um, I'm going to look at um, the effect of different viscosity modifiers on viscosity. Uh, and the reason this is important is we're trying to understand if different viscosity modifiers in a lubricant can lead to different um, fuel efficiency performance. So what we have in this slide are two oils, both SAE 0W30 grades, and they've both been formulated to have a high temperature, high shear viscosity at 150 degrees centigrade of three millipascal seconds. But the um, polymer B on the right hand side, which is a cone polymer, um, actually has a much better performance at lower temperatures than polymer A, which is a polymethacrylate viscosity modifier. So although both of these oils have a HTHS 150 above three millipascal seconds, um, Oil A, if we measure the high temperature, high shear viscosity at 100 degrees C, that is 5.98 millipascal seconds. Well, oil, oil B has a high temperature, high shear viscosity at 100 degrees C of only 5.03 millipascal seconds. And so what we're finding here is that as you go to lower temperatures, the oil formulated with polymer B is giving you much lower viscosities than the oil formulated with polymer A. And as a lot of fuel economy tests are done at lower temperatures than 100 degrees centigrade, the, the oil formulated with polymer B would give you a significant fuel economy benefit compared to the oil formulated with polymer A, even though the HGHS 150 values are the same. So that's one example. And the second example is um, we want to get a better handle on what the viscosity of the lubricants actually are in elastohydrodynamic contacts. So in an elastohydrodynamic contact, we know the pressures are very high, 
and we know that the viscosity of the oil will increase dramatically with pressure. So there's been some interesting work done recently at Imperial College um, where, we, where we've uh, used a special um, molecule called thioflavin T, and this molecule acts as a viscosity sensor. The, um, there's a, a benzene ring and a, a, some other elements coming off it, which basically rotate relative to the rest of the molecule. And that rate of rotation um, can be detected with fluorescence methods, but the rate of rotation also depends on the viscosity of the fluid that that molecule is embedded with in. Um, and so what they've done at Imperial College is they've put um, a fluid into an elastohydrodynamic contact. They've put this viscosity detector molecule into the contact, and they can directly measure the viscosity um, by probing this molecule with fluorescence. So this, um, this graph on the bottom left shows the viscosity of the, uh, of the fluid as you go through the uh, elastohydrodynamic contact. And although this is a model fluid, IGPAL CO520, um, this technique has also been used for standard polyalpha olefin base oils too. And there's further R&D ongoing to investigate what happens when we put a molecule like this into shear thinning fluids. Uh, so my final slide is just going to be, or my final couple of slides, is just going to be talking about the ultimate aim, developing a digital twin for tribology. So digital twins are quite widely used in engineering, uh, particularly in things like structural uh, engineering, so that you can predict uh, what happens when a car crashes, or you can try and predict which parts of a structure will fail. Um, and there's a desire to develop digital twins for tribology so that we can do realistic tribology tests on a computer as opposed to running the tribology test in the lab. However, it's very clear that this is quite a challenge because even in a simple contact like the mini traction machine where we have a ball against a disc, we, we quickly realise that the metals um, that we're running the test on are not homogenous. So the metals usually have oxides at the surface, but also if, we, if we're loading the ball and moving the ball against the disc, the loaded ball can plastically deform um, the metal both in the ball and the disc. And so the, um, the metal surfaces and the way they vary need to be taken into account. Secondly, as I've spoken about before, uh, the lubricant additives form chemical films on the surface, which um, it is not fully understood how those operate and what they do. In addition, we've got rough surfaces and the process of um, the contact will lead to wear. So the top of the rough uh, asparagus will be chopped off and those wear particles will be in the contact acting as lubricants but also potentially abrading the surface. And we could also get the type of wear changing depending on the load. So at low loads, it could well be abrasive wear, but at high loads, it could be adhesive. And so the ability to model all of this in detail will be very challenging. You've got to, you've got to think about the whole system, not just the lubricants uh, or the additives, but also what's happening with the metals and what uh, is happening at the individual asperities. So just to conclude, Unfortunately, I don't have any answers. Um, I'm just saying, in my view, what I think um, are some of the challenges. And certainly, the challenges I've listed here, the three ones in particular, um, are within reach, I think. Uh, we could certainly try and develop improved boundary friction models um, to take account of the uh, tribochemistry additive films, and that would improve on the current Greenwood trip model. Uh, there's certainly scope for iterative friction and wear models that model the evolution of wear of components, and these could be useful for predicting both running in and failure. Um, the third area is a bit more challenging. Um, people outside of the lubricant industry will have great trouble, I think, uh, measuring the lubricant properties sufficiently to know why different lubricants perform in different ways. Um, and so that needs a bit of thought as to how 
that knowledge can be made more available to the academic community. But certainly, this uh, work has given really good insights into why different viscos viscosity modifiers behave differently in terms of energy efficiency. And we're now in a position where that with novel experimental methods, we can directly measure viscosity in a high pressure EHD contact. And ultimately, um, it would be good in a few years to have a digital twin. And there's certainly plenty of groups around the world trying to um, meet this challenge, but it's still quite a major challenge in my view and likely to be a few years away. So thank you for listening. And um, hopefully uh, there'll be a few questions. So thank you. Thanks, Ian. Uh, good stuff. Um, just a quick question um, on the lubricant data. Um, so, so as you mentioned, the, the the properties that are mentioned in the lubricant specifications are fairly limited and probably not enough for you to make any useful predictions in terms of film thickness or fuel efficiency. Do you think there should be a drive to include things like high pressure viscosity and lubricant specifications so that you can kind of make these calculations, or is that a bit unfair on the lubricant formulators? Um, well, it, it's quite expensive to make high pressure viscosity measurements, and there's not that many places around the world that can do them routinely. Um, our experience is that the main contribution to high pressure viscosity are the base oils. And so we've got a pretty good idea of um, what group one and group two and group three and PAO base oils, what their alpha, the pressure viscosity coefficient is. Um, that's usually good enough. Uh, for most purposes. Um, if you want to do a really detailed prediction of performance in elastohydronate contact, you, you probably have to go beyond, go beyond the pure alpha value and have a much better uh, viscosity pressure curve, the sort of things that Scott Baer does. Um, but I think it would be quite difficult for most lubricant suppliers to get that data. Um, well, it, there'd be a big backlog if everyone had to measure that data because the and I mean, if there are places that can do a, um, a a sort of measurement of pressure viscosity coefficients in a quicker and easier way, I mean, there'd be a lot of people interested in that in industry. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I think we, we've certainly got enough data to provide some estimates of what that would be. Uh, okay, probably got time for a quick one. Um, can you please give us your perspective on the challenges for grease lubricants in the next 10 years, as well as as well as well uh, liquid lubricants? Yeah, so grease is a good, a good uh, example, actually, because um, at low speeds, it acts like a solid, and at high speeds, it acts like a fluid. So you've got a viscoelastic effect and a potentially a memory effect. But also the other challenge is in most contacts, the grease is scraped out, and so you have a very thin starved film and you have to worry about how the grease piled up at the edges leaks back into the contact so i think uh there are a number of challenges in modeling what's going on with a grease contact um but from what i've seen one of the key properties of grease is is how the oil leaks back into the contact from the thickener you know if you've got a grease where the oil can get back into the contact quite quickly that usually is helpful in terms of grease performance. Um, but I think it's that is more complicated even than a liquid lubricant. And I think there's enough problems modeling liquid lubricants in detail. So I think greases are, are quite complex uh, fluids, which more, more focus could certainly be done on in terms of modeling greases. Um, there's certainly quite a lot of interesting challenges there, yes. Okay. Thanks, Ian. We better move on. We've got a few more questions, but we'll answer those in the YouTube comments as we did last week. So uh, don't worry if we didn't get time for your question. Um, so now we'll move on to uh, James Batias. Um, Kiara, do you want to give a quick introduction? Yeah. So James, if you want to start sharing your screen. So yep. uh, we have Professor James Batias from Texas A&M University, and he will be talking to us about friction and energy dissipation in 2D materials. Over to you, James. Great. Well, great. Uh, well, first, I want to thank uh, uh, James and Chiara for putting together this, this seminar series. It's kind of exciting to get to see all these folks from around the world um, uh, all, all on my desktop. And so uh, really appreciate the efforts that you, that you put into this and greatly appreciate the sponsors who, who have been supporting this. 
So uh, today I want to talk a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing looking at uh, friction largely in 2D materials. Uh, and you know, as we've just heard, you know, there's also another very important aspect, which is the fact that you know, uh, surfaces uh, uh, are rough and the impact of surface roughness can play a major role in how these materials uh, actually both interact with that surface as well as how they modify the frictional properties of those, of those surfaces. And so for the uh, past several years, we've been looking predominantly at, at materials such as graphene and aluminum disulfide, trying to ask kind of the questions of in these types of nanoscopically rough surfaces, what happens to the frictional properties? How does surface morphology influence the structure? So for example, when you take a nominally flat two-dimensional material and put it on a rough surface, the question is 2D or not 2D? Uh, does it stay flat or does it conform to that surface? How does that substrate chemistry also influence its tribological properties? And there's been a lot, a lot of nice work, and I'll try to give a few uh, examples, illustrating, of course, that with two-dimensional materials, you can achieve uh, incredibly low friction. But at the same time, in some different types of environments, uh, those frictional properties are influenced by the chemical reactivity. And we've started looking at how uh, strain within these materials influences how those materials break down and how that modifies their frictional properties as well. So, you know, we've already heard uh, a fair bit about kind of the challenges in, in tribology. There are many different types of sliding interfaces and contacts, many different types of environments in which we need materials to be able to provide uh, uh, controllable friction, and especially under the conditions of dry sliding or in the boundary lubrication regime. And from our standpoint, coming at this from, uh, from uh, the same way of chemists, you know, we're very interested in understanding, you know, the chemical forces that come into play uh, to influence that, as well as the interactions of these nanoscale disparity disparity contacts uh, that define the high pressures and chemical processes that will occur in these systems, because those contacts actually enable and concentrate uh, tribochemical reactions that can ultimately lead to uh, mechanical wear and, and breakdown. And so we're going to look at that for a couple different systems uh, here today. So, you know, the two-dimensional world uh, uh, started off largely focusing on things like graphene and molybdenum disulfide, uh, but, you know, chemistry, uh, chemistry is fun and you actually have lots of different types of uh, two-dimensional materials that are, that are coming out. And depending on your type of application, uh, you know, these can be applied in ways in which bonding of these materials to surfaces can modify their frictional properties. And you can pick and choose basically what type of platform you want, depending on whether you want something operating at high temperatures, whether you need something operating in, in a vacuum, whether you're looking at uh, kind of mitigating materials in biological environments uh, or other systems where you can, for example, control the slip between the planes of two-dimensional materials and it's that slip plane that will ultimately also dictate the inherent frictional properties of, of, of these systems. And so, as I mentioned kind of right at the, uh, right at the beginning of the, of the, of the presentation, um, the, uh, these two-dimensional materials have already shown that there can be very low friction. And this low friction uh, can be attributed back to the atomic scale structure of the, of the materials. And this takes us back to kind of just the basic models of atomic scale stick slip and how that translates into super lubricity. And so if we think about two atomically well-defined surfaces, when you have all the atomic species, uh, all the, the structure aligned, as you start to slide over this type of surface, you have to move in and out of the inner atomic potentials to be able to trans, uh, transcend that barrier and it's that barrier that ultimately provides the, uh, the friction that, that is observed. And this has been observed in detail, and I'll uh, show an example in a second here uh, uh, for uh, uh, these atomically smooth, smooth films. What happens though, is that as soon as you rotate even slightly the positions of those atomic lattices, you can actually achieve uh, conditions of super lubricity. Why? Because you're now distorting basically that interaction potential. Uh, you don't have to slide in and out of those atomic scale potentials. And so it really doesn't take too much to modify the frictional properties simply by controlling the structure of the interface. And from the standpoint of you know, real applications, 
this is kind of exciting because if you think about most surfaces, most surfaces are amorphous. And so you have some net inherent uh, friction dictated by just the chemical makeup and the mechanical properties of those two interfaces. If you want to apply an atomically thin film, you could now introduce uh, these types of conditions where you can actually achieve super lubricious conditions uh, without much, uh, much, much effort. Now, of course, there are challenges in, in making that actually a reality, and I'll talk about some of those in just, in just a second. But a lot of this was first, you know, kind of uh, measured back in the early 1980s. So Matthew Mates, using AFM, uh, measured uh, atomic scale uh, stick slip uh, on graphitic surfaces. And then later, you know, work uh, from, uh, from Shinjo and Martin Dienweevil looked at basically how just simple rotations of the, uh, of the uh, lattices of contacting surfaces could be used to modify those frictional properties. And here I just kind of want to point out that just looking at a graphing uh, at a graph by graph like contact, what you could observe is that only when you're sliding along specific lattice orientations do you actually have high friction. So what this means is that by introducing on an amorphous surface a material that has any type of two-dimensional periodicity, you can actually, for the most part, have a much a very effective reduction in, in friction uh, driven by that. And that's all great, you know, when we look at these atomically smooth films, but does it really translate into, into the macro scale? And to some extent, yes, yes, it does. So there was some very nice work uh, done out of Argonne National Labs, looking at the frictional properties of graphene uh, on surfaces. And uh, the measurements that they were doing was they were dis dispersing first graphene sheets onto silica surfaces. And uh, uh, then uh, measuring uh, with a pin on disc the, the uh, frictional properties as a function of the number of rotation, uh, rotation cycles. And what you can see over here in, in, in figure B is that if you look at kind of the coefficient of friction, there's a standard run in and then a decrease in the friction coefficient as the number of cycles move, move along. And for a system in which Graphene was just put on the, on the surface using a, a diamond-like carbon uh, 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 probe. What you see is that you know friction starts off relatively high, drops off to then a friction coefficient about 0.05, and then the material begins to wear off the surface after some number of, uh, of cycles. Now, in this particular work, they also examined what happened if they added other materials, and so one of the materials that they added was this uh, this nano diamond. Uh, particles. So these particles are on the order of a few nanometers. And what they discovered is that if they added nano diamonds to these materials, it would also start to rip up the surface. Graphene would also then start to wrap around and form almost like these little ball bearings on the interface. So you were able to create these uh, basically uh, nano ball bearing structures in which you would then have graphene on graphene sliding. And again, if we think back to that uh, last slide right where I showed that, you know, only along certain last directions do you have high, high friction. On average, the friction coefficient would be much slower in that sliding, sliding contact. And so what they're able to show is the evolution of this material at the surface, wrapping up, picking up graphene flakes, and then creating a sliding interface where they actually were able to then achieve super lubricious uh, conditions uh, with friction coefficients out to several thousand cycles of, uh, of, of less than 0.005. And this is just an, a, a TEM micrograph showing the formed nanoscroll uh, graphenes wrapped around the nanoparticle diamond. Now, this was, this was all great and fine and dandy. This was all done under dry sliding conditions, under dry conditions, so no water present. If you introduce water, this completely fails. And so one of the challenges there is this raises the question in our mind of kind of, well, number one, first, what are the properties that lead to, of course, the mechanical distortions and, and structures that are formed here? Uh, we normally think of these materials as being very, uh, very chemically inert and, and stable. How do the high pressure contacts that evolve here uh, influence them for uh, reactions with their environment? So, you know, we were thinking that basically probably what's happening is that uh, as these uh, materials get wrapped around and you form these nanoparticle structures, it probably significantly strains the graphene membranes in these particle contacts. And that strain likely leads to a mechanical, mechanochemical breakdown of those materials and ultimately failure of that, of that for controlling. 
uh, the frictional properties. So, you know, became interested in, a, in looking at these things in a number of different uh, number of different ways. So, as I mentioned earlier, you know, one of the things that we have to take into account, uh, whether it be with nanoparticles in a contact or whether it be with surfaces that are just inherently rough, is the fact that surfaces, because of their inherent roughness, you have these nanoscopic asperities. Where at these nanoscopic asperities, uh, what you will be seeing is that you have regions of high localized pressure. This high localized pressure can actually help drive chemical reactions because the localized pressures actually distort the reaction potential barriers, making it easier for a chemical reaction to occur between two, two interfaces. This is, this is the realm of, of tribochemistry or mechanochemistry. But another thing that I want to point out about these nanoscopic asperities is that these are also reactant concentrators. And so if you have water vapor or other materials in a contact, they can be localized through capillary condensation at these, at these, at these conditions. And so the ambient conditions might seem quite modest, but the local conditions of the chemical reactants can actually be significantly influenced both by the structure as well as the forces that are being applied in these interfaces. So we kind of wanted to put all of these things together and examine you know, how does this influence friction in, in two-dimensional materials. So here was our question. What happens to 2D materials when surfaces get rough? Besides the fact that actually you end up breaking a lot of AFM tips on rough surfaces. There was some initial modeling uh, in 2009, kind of looking at if you take you know, some unique, you know, well-defined two-dimensional material, so in this case, we can think of it as kind of a plastic sheet, and you put this onto a rough surface, you can measure the extent of interaction of that two-dimensional material with the surface by just looking at the relative ratio of the area of the sheet to the area to the actual area of the substrate. And so with it being completely non-conformed, this would be zero. With it being fully conformed, this would be one. And it probably comes as no surprise that depending on the surface roughness and depending on the chemical interactions between the material and the substrate and the inherent bending rigidity of the material, you have a competition of forces. And this competition of forces is what drives basically what's going to happen to this material on any particular surface. You know, we might nominally think of things like graphene as being very stable and very planar, largely because of the large density of uh, double bonded uh, carbons within the, uh, within the system. But if the interaction strength is strong enough, what can happen is you can actually distort that material. And so what we have to be cognizant of is that depending on roughness, and depending on the interaction strength, we will likely see variations in the structure. So the way we set out to kind of look at this was to take films and create films with well-defined roughness. And the way that we did this is we used silicon nanoparticles. So we use silicon nanoparticles ranging from roughly six nanometers in the diameter up to about 85 nanometers in diameter. And we would deposit those as a thin film using spin coating to make a thin film of nanoparticles on a surface. And then we would deposit graphene on top of that, of that rough surface. And the approach that we used is, is, illustrated, uh, is illustrated here. Um, we put our nanoparticle film down. We took a chunk of graphite and some water-soluble tape. We put this into a hot water bath, dissolve off that tape once we've pressed enough graphite onto the surface. And then we would do mechanical exfoliation to kind of thin that down and thin that down and thin that down until we had regions with, you know, few, one, few, and multi-layer uh, graphene on the surface. And you can observe this directly optically because of the optical contrast between the silica film and the, and the graphene. And so we have regions with lots of thick chunks, you know, many, many, many layers of uh, gra graphite on the surface, down to regions like this where we can actually observe single and few layer uh, graphene. And, you know, since we're microscopists, you know, we can cheat and we can just go right to the area of interest and say, okay, I want to look at uh, what happens if I create a nanoparticle film and then deposit single and few layer graphene on top of that. And as I mentioned, we've looked at this for a series of different uh, uh, particle films in part and, and it, to control the inherent surface roughness. And we can identify both optically as well as from Raman microspectroscopy whether we have one, two, or three layers. And so we can go in and we can optically uh, measure that. This is the uh, 2D to G uh, uh, ratio optical image of uh, this region and this and this region, showing that we have single layer here, single, two, three, four, and so on. Here's two, three, 
and so on and some single layer uh, that's in there. And we, then we can go in by AFM and begin to interrogate these regions and examine the structure and the frictional properties. So I'm gonna come back to this later, but we actually are also gonna use the shifts in these Raman peaks to also help us not, not just identify basically uh, you know, how many layers we have, but also to help us identify local chemical distortions because the D band here, which is the defect band, is actually very sensitive to local chemical reactions. And so we can use this as a spy to kind of tell us where the material is also breaking down. So when we look at uh, graphene on rough surfaces, uh, what we see is the following. You know, if we go from a flat surface to these large nanoparticles on an atomically smooth surface, here we have single layer graphene deposited on all these films. We go from less than one nanometer RMS up to about 11 nanometers RMS, RMS. And what you can quickly see is that until you get up to about 20 nanometer particle, nanoparticles with six nanometers uh, RMS roughness, it's very difficult to distinguish actually where the graphene is about us on the surface. And this is due to the fact that at these relatively low roughnesses with these very sharp asperities, uh, what is observed is that the graphene tries to conform very tightly to the substrate. It's not until you get to these larger spacings where it simply can't distort and conform, and you can see it quite clearly in the 50 and 85 nanometer, that you have these asperities and you have a layer of graphene just kind of draped over that. So you, what you end up with is you end up with regions where you have lots of distortion at the peaks of asperities, where it's, the film is also going to be more strained, and then other regions where the film is, is not particularly strained uh, at, at all. And now if you think about how this is, influences the frictional properties, uh, it's going to be depending on, of course, loads and pressures and uh, uh, local chemical interactions, because these regions are going to be, are going to be flexible. And so we've looked at that for a number of different systems. This is just an example of what graphene looks like on a uh, two-dimensional surface. Um, uh, sorry, this is just an example of what graphene looks like on a 20 nanometer particle film. Just a single layer. Here's the uh, ex uh, just exposed nanoparticles. You put our single layer on here. As you go from the very rough surface, what you see is that the graphene only partially conforms to that, to that substrate. So it's relatively weakly adhered to that, uh, to that substrate. Uh, as you go from single layer to few layer, the relative roughness goes down because the film becomes much more stable and the interplanar interactions help also help stiffen uh, that material. But you can still see the fact that there are inherent distortions to the, uh, to the graphene uh, layer that, that come out of that. And in fact, if you look at the edges where the, gra where the graphene is, where it has no friends on this side, what you notice initially is that it's very tightly conformed to the surface. And then it's not until you get farther into the film that it becomes uh, basically smoother uh, within that uh, structure. So looking at these types of things, what, what does the friction look like? So here we examined uh, just uh, briefly on, on that same type of uh, uh, 20 nanometer nanoparticle film, again, this six nanometer RMS roughness. Here we examined uh, you know, basically the frictional properties on one, two, three, four layer uh, 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 graphene. And so here's the topographic image. I apologize for the contrast scale because of these very bright uh, features here. It's harder to see the, the distinct the, the differences here, but we have the Raman data that corresponds with this. But if you look in the friction, what you see is that one layer has higher friction than two layers, has higher friction than three layers, has higher friction than four layers. And this was measured with a relatively fat AFM tip that had a, a raised of curvature of about 130 nanometers. And so what we see uh, is that as you go from single layer to bilayer to multi-layer, in this case, four layers of graphene, the friction starts higher and then decreases. And this is very consistent with what's been seen actually on atomically smooth surfaces. So there was you know, work from Carpic and Hone uh, back in, in 2010, looking at this layer dependence of two-dimensional materials and showing that yes, as you go from one to bulk, one layer to bulk, what you see is that the film becomes more stable and the friction goes down to a, to a uniform value. And this was at that time largely attributed to the fact that well, the AFM tip can pick up the graphene partially. And all this really points to is the fact that, you know, friction in these contexts is, is now a competition between whether the graphene would rather adhere to the substrate or the tip. And so what that means is that you can play a game with this competition and, and basically control that friction uh, uh, even though the material can be the same, 
just the, the subtle distortions of the uh, structure of the two contexts can influence that. And so, for example, if we go back and do our measurement again with a uh, relatively sharp tip, so that first measurement that I showed was using a relatively fat tip, 130 nanometers phase of curvature. Now, if we do something with a relatively sharp probe that now has similar dimension to the particle sizes that are on the surface, what you see is that that difference between single and bilayer and also in multilayer actually completely disappears. And so here was kind of the first example there. We had our kind of our fat tip where we went from single to bilayer to uh, multilayer. The friction showed layer dependence. This layer dependence disappears once you, you basically equilibrate what those two contacts uh, look like. So what this tells us is that by modifying the chemical interactions between the two surfaces, we should be able to actually then inherently control and tune what friction we want at that, at that surface. And so we went about starting to look at that uh, by utilizing, by using some chemical functionalization of the surface. So uh, silanes, trichlorosilanes, trioxysilanes are routinely used to modify silica interfaces. And so we set about, uh, you know, kind of trying to think about, well, let's change some of the chemical interactions between the graphene and the substrate and see how that influences the friction. So we looked at these three systems, octadecyl trichlorosilane, so this terminates in a methyl group, uh, this 3 amino propyl trioxysilane, which terminates in an amine species, and this uh, 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 phenyl ethyl uh, trichlorosilane, which terminates in a, in a phenyl ring. So look at kind of pi-pi interactions between these interfaces. And we went about just first measuring this by just taking a clean tip that's just hydroxyl clean and hydroxyl terminated, and then putting these three different species on there and examining both the friction and the adhesion of these types of interfaces. And what we see is the, is the following. So uh, graphene is a, a relatively hydrophobic. Uh, and when we look at just a clean AFM tip that's been fully hydroxylated interacting with that surface, the work of adhesion is relatively small. And these were all done with uh, a, a almost identical radii of curvature. And we've also uh, taken into account variations in the radius of curvature in these measurements. Um, when you convert that to an amine species where it's a little more, a little more polarized, you see an increase in the work of adhesion. The methyl interaction is quite strong. So this hydrophobic, hydrophobic uh, interface becomes quite strong. And then also when you go to a phenyl interaction with the, uh, with the, with the pi system, you see a uh, significant increase in the work of adhesion as well. And this actually compares very well with just a pi-pi interaction at that, at, that, at that interface. What that tells us is that if we kind of want to staple this graphene down to the surface, we should probably use something like this to help increase that substrate uh, graphene interaction. And so we did that and went to look at the frictional properties. And so we did this on both flat surface as well as those same types of, of rough surfaces. And instead of completely removing the uh, layer dependence as we expected, because we thought we would stabilize this, there were, the adhesion would be strong to the substrate and weak to the tip. Uh, instead, what we see is layer dependence in almost all of these conditions, even with a relatively sharp tip. And that's because, well, we forgot about the fact that, oh, well, friction isn't just about the local interaction and the uh, applied forces, but there's also a shear strain component. And so when you have this molecular monolayer in between these two interfaces, you have to take into account the fact that that molecular monolayer has its own inherent shear strain. And in the case that we looked at with uh, OTS, its shear strain actually significantly increased the, uh, the friction in that contact which is why we would then see greater drag and interaction in, uh, with, with that interface. So never forget the shear strain. Now there are other effects uh, that, that come into play and this has to do with the fact that uh, the, uh, uh, the films are actually not, not uh, sitting still. So for example, if we look at our different particle films under applied load or under negative load, for the surfaces where the uh, where the graphene is uh, highly uh, is highly conformed to the surface uh, and uh, tightly bonded to the surface, what you see is there's very little difference in what the surface looks like. We decrease the roughness, so, uh, increase the roughness a little bit, and weaken that overall substrate interaction. What you see is that when you go to negative load, you start to see the graphene actually getting pulled up by the AFM tip from the surface. And this is even more distinct when you have regions where, again, you have bound and suspended areas of graphene on the surface. So, you know, now if you think about this in terms of an actual sliding contact, what you're going to have is you're going to have distortions of that contact. I'm going to skip this slide because we're running short on time. 
uh, you're going to see actual distortions of that contact. They're going to be fluctuating depending on the local uh, local uh, uh, forces they're acting there. And so here is just a little movie where we've looked at this at the distortions of the surface under different applied under different applied forces. And what you can see is that as you balance out the interactions between the tip and the substrate, what you see structurally could be completely different. So for example, if I measured at high load where I could actually see my particles versus, versus if I measured at relatively modest loads, I might think that my surface is completely smooth. Or if I measured in negative load, I'm actually pulling the graphene up out of the surface. And so these fluctuations and distortions are all going to influence the overall stability and the frictional properties of that two-dimensional material. And in fact, they significantly also influence the inherent reactivity or breakdown of that material. And to examine that, we used a very simple probe to look at that. We used this molecule 4-MBD. 4-MBD actually reacts via radical reaction with graphitic interfaces. And you can take this species, react it with graphene, eliminate a double bond. And when you do that, you actually create a defect in the, uh, in the graphene surface. And you actually can just measure this, this defect by looking at the appearance of the D-band. Uh, so we have a nice, simple molecular probe to look at how much does molecular strain influence the net reactivity or breakdown of that material. And so here we've looked at this for a series of different films, flat six nanometer particle films and 85 nanometer particle films. These are the Raman images, Raman maps before and after reaction with 4-NBD. And I hope what's easy to notice is that as you go to the most strained, the most highly strained material, what you see is that uh, the, uh, the defect band is significantly increased. And you know, this is due to the fact that the localized strains in the graphene are very high at the peaks of these types of particle, particle asparagus. So I'm almost out of, oh, I'm almost out of time. Uh, we've also started to compare this uh, with uh, uh, just by DFT calculations as well. And what we can see is that the addition of that species, uh, the net inherent stabilization energy goes down significantly, even with very subtle distortion. So now if you imagine that you have a two-dimensional material on a surface where there's lots of various fluctuations and forces, you can have very distinct differences in where that material will, will break down just due to simple local distortions. So there's a lot to the story of trying to understand how to utilize these two-dimensional materials uh, for friction modifiers. And I'm gonna just skip to the summary here and uh, just thank everyone for, uh, 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 for uh, listening. Um, you know, as we, as we mentioned, these two-dimensional materials, you know, will conform partially to surfaces. We see very similar things for MOS2 that will have to be another uh, plus 25 minute uh, present presentation. Um, we can monitor that by Raman. We can look at those local distortions and chemical interactions and really begin to get a sense of what happens in these types of sliding contacts where we're using two dimensional materials as friction modifiers. And with that, let me just say thank my group. Uh, most of this work was done by Dr. Megalinsky, who's now a postdoc at, at UPenn and soon to be an assistant professor at Hope College, Zhou Tong Liu, Nate Hawthorne, Quinterius Moore, who's a Dewey uh, Computational Graduate uh, Fellow, and Jessica Spear, who's at uh, UIUC, and our funding sources. And thank you for, uh, for, for listening. Thanks, James. Really interesting talk. Uh, probably got time for just one quick question. Um, so for the, um, for the friction in the graphene uh, nanoparticle systems, were those tested in dry or humid air? Um, and would the water, if there was humidity there, be able to affect the friction by penetrating the silicon dioxide graphene interfaces? Uh, so, yes, those were all done under dry nitrogen conditions. Uh, we've examined what happens when you introduce water vapor into those contacts. And in some cases, uh, if the film is not completely uniform, you can get water actually trapped underneath the films. And this also influences the, uh, the, the, the frictional properties. And we've started looking at basically uh, what happens when you start modifying both sides of, the, of those surfaces. So uh, yes to all of the above. Thank you very much. So uh, if I just pack, pass back to Chiara to close the meeting and tell you a bit about next week's, uh, thanks to both our speakers again. And.
Thank you everyone for the great talks and thanks to everyone for listening. Uh, so I hope you'll join us again next week when we will have Professor Lars Prastevka from the University of Freiburg and Professor Guillermo Morales Espejel from SKF and INSA Lyon. Um, I just want to remind everyone that this live stream will then be a video on YouTube on our channel. Uh, those who didn't have their questions answered, they the questions will be answered during the week. Uh, not on the live chat where you're typing because they will be closed after the live run. So we'll move the comments that haven't been answered underneath the video. So please make sure that you check again there to see the answer and interact with the speakers in that way. I would like also to remind everyone that on the 11th of June, we have a Twitter poster conference. And uh, so that is a great way to showcase your work. There will be prizes and the winners will also get to present uh, like a, do a short five minute presentation during uh, the following seminars. So since the videos have been watched, the only video that we have up actually have been watched over 700 times, it's really a great way to showcase your work. And with this, I thank the speakers again and thanks all of you and see you next week. Goodbye.